NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On NHL your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Joe DiBiase from Locked On Sabres, Mike DiStefano from Locked On Leafs. Mike's Indianapolis Colts had a very uh, rough loss no. over the weekend. Um, but, yeah. hey, your Blue Jays doing some things in free agency, so that's got to feel good. One of your teams has had a good weekend, right? Our Blue Jays, Joe. Our Blue Jays, right. I'm sorry. I'm, I, it, 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 Something inside me won't allow me to say that about any baseball team. <laughs> but yes, I should say our Blue Jays. Our Blue Jays. Yeah, our no, Blue they, Jays. Uh, you know, they, they let Ray and Simeon walk, but they brought in Gosman and uh, we'll see. I'm sure they got a couple more moves up their sleeve. The, mm-hmm. uh, the off season is nowhere near being done. I think technically as of tomorrow is that the work stoppage starts with the, yeah. the strike or the CBA, whatever the hell they want to call it. But uh, yeah, it's been a wild couple of days in, in baseball. The amount of money that baseball players get, over hockey players is insane. Like mm. Connor McDavid, the best hockey player in the world, gets paid twelve and a half million bucks a year. Did you see what Max Scherzer just got paid? Is it like thirty something per year? Is it more than that? Even I don't Dude, know. Three years, a hundred and thirty million dollars. <laughs> like it's ridiculous. Absolutely, it's it's like forty forty three million bucks a season. He yeah. literally makes thirty million more than Connor McDavid. I always find that funny with the NBA. Uh, he plays one every five games, Joe. Right, one, one every, every five. five games. And he doesn't even play the whole game. But <laughs> yeah, he plays like six, seven innings, and then right. he's done, if that. Um, I always play this game with the NBA because NBA players that like you've heard of maybe make the same as Connor McDavid, who makes the most yeah, in the NHL. Uh, Luke Kennard of the Los Angeles Clippers makes 12.7 million a year. Robert Covington of the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, I could go on and on. Christian Wood, someone who plays for the Houston Rockets. I've never heard of. So yeah, hockey players, they're, they're always they're lagging behind the revenue is lower. It, that's, it's expected. I would, I would guess um, it'll, it'll go up though. I mean, once, once things finally start to go up that new ESPN money, but yep. then once they get through this pandemic, which, Seems to be never ending at this Mm -hmm. point. Uh, well, two steps forward, one step back, sort of deal. But you know, hopefully, those, those, uh, you know, those contracts, those new TV deals definitely should allow the the league to increase that payroll, uh, over the next few seasons. Obviously, not over the next couple because we know that we it's going to be a flat cap, but eventually, Mm -hmm. I think we'll see those numbers get up into the 90s and into the hundred million dollar range when it comes to the cap. and we could start seeing some of these other guys start to make a little bit more ching. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff we're going to get to today. One, I'm man, I might rant about it for a while. The potential of the NHL not going to the Olympics now that there are COVID outbreaks all over the NHL. Maybe not outbreaks, but you have cases all over the NHL right now. I think might be a better way to put it. Um, all over North America, all over the world, man. Right. Like the exactly. world is just, oh my God, this new variant too puts a little wrinkle into things. It's yep. scary stuff. Like I said, two Super, steps forward, one step back. Super. It's like the rates are around the same that they were last year at this time. And if you look at any chart of when um, po- positive COVID cases started to skyrocket, when hospitalization rates started to skyrocket, it was like this week last year. And it's happening again this week. So I, maybe that's just life from now on, man. People like, are indoors, just, right? We get to winter. People are indoors, right? And like masks go on, places shut down, and people get sick. Like, I, hope not, man. I hope that's not life in perpetuity, but we'll hopefully that ends at some point. Um, so in terms of what that means for the NHL and the Olympics, we'll get to that. Uh, Jack Hughes signs an extension today with the New Jersey Devils, and it's a pretty spicy one. Eight years, $64 million. We'll talk more about that and the Devils' decision to give him that contract. Um, and then Alex Ovechkin MVP odds. We'll get to that as well, plus a little bit on the NHL power rankings. This actually might even relate to that. I wanted to throw a little surprising question your way that we didn't talk about before we got going here because I wanted to hear your natural re- reaction to it. Okay. I'm obsessed. For some reason, never been a college football fan for my entire life. For some reason, this year, 
I don't know if it's just fresh blood, new teams that are involved, if it's the coaching stuff. I'd like to sit up on the moral high ground and tell you it's because players are getting paid now. I am a 100% believer, and that should be the case. I'm also not thinking about that when the games go on, so I don't think that's it. So I don't really know why I'm into college football more than I am this year. But tonight, uh, or Tuesday, is the uh, unveiling of the college football playoff rankings. So I wanted to throw your way. If this were the case right now in the National Hockey League, and I made you czar of the the National Hockey League playoff rankings, and you had a top four today, who would your top four be? Oh, man. So this is essentially a power ranking that I got to go kind through of. and do myself. Yes. Okay. Um, My top four. Oh, interesting. Okay. Let me go ahead. I'll pull up the standings just so that I can get a peek at who the guys up at the top are right now. So. Um, I believe that the best team in the league right now is probably the Carolina Hurricanes. I truly do. I think that they're playing exceptional, exceptional hockey. Um, so I probably have the Carolina Hurricanes up at number one. At number two, I might add the Toronto Maple Leafs. Oh, I'm over. I over. Have you been <laughs> watching <funny>. them? Have <laughs> you been watching the Maple no, Leafs I, as of they've late? Been, they've been damn good. <laughs> oh, have they ever been damn good? They're winners of 14 of their last 16 games with like a 160 goals a- against. Like they've been unreal so far this season. They've got like they're in the month of November, they've got the third best power play, the third best penalty kill. They're scoring goals at will. They're keeping him out of the back of the net. They're playing in tight games. They're they're starting to have those expected goals turn into goals. Things are going well for Toronto. So I think right now, and they're getting the goaltending, not just from Jack Campbell, from even a guy like Joseph Wall, who, you know, people probably don't even know who the heck that guy is, but he was a third round pick a few years ago. He's three and zero on the season. He's got like a 160 goals against and like a 930 save percentage, and he got a shutout against the Islanders uh, a couple of nights ago. I know you know who he is because he played a game against uh, Buffalo, which he didn't look that great, but he followed it up with two exceptional performances against the Islanders and against the Sharks. So um, they're kind of everything's going right for Toronto. Do I think they are the second best team? Will they finish out as the second best? Will they win a Stanley Cup? Perhaps not. I mean, we all know the faults they have in the playoffs, but right now, if I had to do a college, you know, style ranking mm-hmm. system, I think I would put them at number two. Um, then at number three, ooh, probably. What about Florida? Florida, yeah, probably Florida. I mean, it's it's almost a coin flip between Toronto and, and Florida, uh, but I think I would put Florida at three. And then, geez, maybe it's a coin flip again between Calgary and Washington. I'll give the nod to Washington, I guess, just because Ovechkin's playing at an unbelievable clip right now. Um, they've won seven of their last 10 games. This guy's scoring goals at will. But, I mean, what Calgary has been able to do as of late, you see the first 19 games of the season, they got seven shutouts. Seven yeah. shutouts in 19 <laughs> years. Hadn't happened yeah. since the 1920s, almost 100 years since we've seen those kind of statistics. Um, so if I had to do a top four, I think I would have Washington edging out Calgary. But uh, it's it's pretty close. But those would be my top four teams with Calgary as an honorable mention. I think the only team I'd want to throw in the mix there, I think I'd probably get to Washington too as my four, and I would have the same top three as you. Would be Minnesota. I was gonna the, I was gonna say that. Them. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, and at the end of this, like, I think Tampa will work their way into that mix once they start to get healthy. Yes. I mean, no point, no Kucherov. Like that's that's clearly gonna hurt them. Um, I Colorado. think Colorado's, you know, in, inching their way into that category right now. McKinnon's been out for a while. He's gonna return tomorrow, actually, against the Maple Leafs. Kadri's filled in amazingly, actually. He's like what is the happening in, there? Fourth in the league in scoring this guy. Like, where did yeah. that come from? Uh, but they're a team that I would expect to kind of fight their way into that top four, top five by the end of the season. But right now, I think I got to go Carolina, Toronto, Washington, Florida, all four teams in the East. So while we're let's 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 move this up to the front of the show here while we're kind of on power ranking stuff, because our locked on NHL power rankings will come out tomorrow on Wednesday. And really, we've been doing this every Tuesday, kind of previewing what we might see um, from the locked on NHL uh, local experts uh, as they vote on who the best teams are and who the worst teams are. Risers and fallers. I think we both came to a, an agreement that we see the Flyers as a team that's going to fall. 
Yeah, I, I'd have to agree with that. They're, what, 2-8 and eight in their last 10 games. They haven't been playing yep. particularly well. Um, I, I think that they're a team that's certainly going to end up falling here. Uh, they were, at one point, like right in the mix there in the division, now starting to fall out of it just a little bit. I think there's still, obviously, so much of a runway that they're not completely out of it. But uh, they got off to a really good start, but they've kind of fallen down a little bit. Um, they're 8-8-4 eight, eight and four now on the year but yeah just two six and two in their last 10 they've lost a couple in a row i could see them taking a bit of a tumble in our power rankings yeah i think they're gonna get there elliot friedman today on his podcast was talking about like ottawa trading for claude Giroux, um like as just a speculatory move that the senators might like and i'm thinking like all right is is philly gonna start selling off pieces like that these veteran pieces because they're not a young team I mean, no. Giroux, the look at their leading scorers. Giroux is 34, Couturier is 29, Cam Atkinson 32, Derek Broussard 34. Like the top four guys in terms of scoring are all basically 30 and then into their mid 30s. Um, Joel Farabee has been like the one young guy really that's been productive for them offensively, and that's really it. Um, so I, I think, you know, if they're going to continue to be this this bad, and they've been pretty bad, I think something happens. I might imagine they could get to a coaching change before they make some drastic move um, with their, with their forward group. Uh, Elaine Vigneault yeah. maybe could be moved on from, but in terms maybe. of our power rankings, I think they're going to move down too. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, that, that makes sense. Cause it's a team that you would think are in win now mode. Like this right. isn't a team that's ready to punt on the season. Cause they can't punt because this is, I mean, their guys aren't getting any younger, like you said. So they kind of got to win now if they want to, you know, establish themselves as a playoff team, get some of that playoff revenue. Um, because mm -hmm. if they don't get it going now, then, I mean, things could go south pretty quick. Um, it's a pretty tough, tough division, as we've talked about a lot on this podcast, on this Tuesday edition. Um, but I, 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 I honestly, they were what, 14th, 15th? Last year or uh, last week on our rankings, let me quickly check. I think they were they were sixteenth, sixteenth, sixteenth. Okay, so they're dead smack in the middle. I think they fall out of the top twenty. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, this is not like a typical Flyers team where what usually lets them down is goal the goaltending. Yeah. They're getting good goaltending this year. Carter Hart is seventeenth in the NHL and five on five save percentage. I know his total number is even better than that at a 920 Martin Jones is at a 921 and then for the goals against uh 2.67 for Hart 2.87 for Jones like they've been good they haven't been the best team in the league and you know why they've been good you know why why Rasmus Ristolainen oh get out of here with that <laughs> I've if you I don't know how many flyer people you follow but it's the same it's the cycle of life Ristolainen has a, an amazing play offensively he blasts somebody with a big hit some other team's best player gets upset because they get annoyed playing against him. And then he has three games in a row where it's just turnovers, 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 giveaways, and it's in the back of your net. And just you're scratching your head. What is this guy doing? He is a roller coaster. And it's not a surprise to me that, you know, he's on a team now that's talking about coaching changes, maybe, and blowing it up. Um, so I think the Flyers move down. You think the Penguins move up? The Penguins are down at – they were down at 23 last week. I do. I, I think this Penguins team is pretty good. They're getting exceptional goaltending out of Tristan Jari. I mean, this guy's having a a, a Vesna like campaign. Like he, he truly, truly is. And you take a look at what the team has been able to do lately. They're five one and one in their last uh, in their last seven games and with three shutouts in there. And one of the one of the losses was a a shootout loss. We lost two one. So effectively only giving only one goal in that game. So for the last six games, they've given up uh zero and then one goal in a game that went into a shootout. So they're getting the goaltending. Um, you, we all know about the offense on that team. I mean, Jake Gensel, Sidney Crosby, Brian Rust, Geno Malkin's going to come back pretty soon. Um, I, I think this is a team that's on the rise, and if they can get that goaltending uh, consistently is the key word, consistently, you know, they're a team that's definitely going to be uh, in the mix there in the Metro division and potentially in the wild card, and I certainly see them as a better than 23rd team in the league, 100%. I agree. I think they'll they'll get into the teens at least. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be but like legitimately flip last week with the Flyers and the Penguins, and yes. I'd be happy. Right? Put the Pens at 16, put the Flyers at 23. I think that makes a lot of sense going into this week. I agree. I would do the same thing. 
I still got to get those Rangers out of there too. They're down at eight. And from last week, I mean, I think they're complete frauds, complete frauds. <laughs> they're on uh, a three game winning streak, Joe. I know. I know. And they're fourth in the NHL in, in point percentage. Um, but holy cow, I just I watch them play and it's like they never have the puck. They never have the puck, but they're getting away with it. And maybe, hey, over the that could happen. They could just get really good goaltending. They could grind out these victories all season long and they could that, that can work in the NHL. Um so the J.S. Jaguar of 2003. That's he won the vet. He won the uh, the con smite that year, didn't he? That's right. That's right. Um, by the way, uh, Tristan Jari. I still have that five on five save percentage uh, page open from Stupid, a Carter Hart. Jari's third in the NHL, only behind Jack Campbell and Jacob Markstrom. Um, nice. Jack Campbell. J- right. Jack Campbell. J- but Jari's been. Super he's fun. been exceptional. He's been exceptional this season. I even saw, I think he's second in goalie point share as well. Okay. Um, so yeah. like he's, he's really had a, a terrific season for Pittsburgh and the biggest, I think reason hey. why that team is, is, you know, where they are right now. Cause remember they were missing Crosby for quite some time. He had an injury and then he came back and he had COVID a little bit of a slow start. They haven't had Gensel uh, there or they haven't had Malkin at all. You know, Gensel missed some time, Rust missed some time. Uh, Latang missed some time, and it's been Jari keeping them alive. It looks like they they made the right decision in net last offseason. <laughs> you think? Matt you Marie. think? Are Matt we going to get to that? Is that what's next? <laughs> uh, did he go unclaimed on waivers, or is that he not even decided he went unclaimed? He I, I mean, obviously that contract's brutal. Um, we are going to move on to what's going to happen with the Olympics. And then I want to talk about Jack Hughes as well. And then Alex Ovechkin MVP odds, but actually real quick, let's sneak in here. Um, any thought as to who, do you have any opinion on the Montreal Canadiens GM search? There was stuff on Danny Briere today for that. Uh, and I saw odds actually were listed on it. Uh, Matthew Darsh, Darsh, who I've never heard of was the favorite at plus plus one twenty five. Yeah, he's uh, Briere, Briere plus plus one fifty, And then, Maybe they're just throwing out names to get people to bet on it, but Patrick Wah at plus 600, Marty Brodeur at plus 1,400, Roberto Luongo at plus 1,400. I don't know if any of those guys are serious, but Briere's name Friedman was talking about today. Any thought on that at all? Uh, Luongo and Brodeur are random to me. I have not heard those just, names. Yeah. Patrick Wah, he threw his, his name into the, into the ring today. Um, he's kind of beating his chest. He'd like to do it. But let's be honest, it's – it's kind of a, it's just a title. Like the, the GM of this team is Jeff Gordon. Right. That is the general manager. He's the guy who's going to be making all the decisions, but in Montreal, you have to have a bilingual French speaking general manager. So really the guy who is given the title as the GM is just going to be a puppet for Jeff Gordon. So it doesn't really matter as long as somebody is bilingual can speak French um, that that's, that's really, I think the guy who's going to do it. That's why I think Matthew Darsh, who is currently an assistant GM, I believe with the, with the lightning, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, I believe he played in Montreal as well. So he, he knows the market pretty well. Uh, I know that there was some legitimate, you know, dis- discourse around Patrick Waugh. I would not, if I were them, you're talking about someone who's just quietly going to, um, just be a yes man. I don't think Patrick Wah is going to be that. So I, I would not think that he's going to do it. Plus, it was a very bad breakup between Patty Wah and the Montreal Canadiens. Um, another interesting little thing is Jeff Molson, the owner, did say that they're interested in, in kind of being um, at the forefront of progressiveness. And they would love to have some. Um, oh, boy, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, women could be involved here. Women okay. could be involved. Here. Inclusiveness. That's the word I was looking for. Um, inclusiveness and, and potentially, uh, you know, there's some, there's some ladies that could be, that could be involved. Some, some, uh, you know, Kim St. Pierre, I, I heard was maybe somebody who could do it. Goyette is somebody who could do it. Uh, so that, that's really intriguing and interesting to me. I know that we finally got our first pro sports um, North American pro sport GM last year in the sport of baseball. Um, uh, mm. I, I her name's slipping me right now, but she's the GM of the Marlins. So, you know, I wonder if that is a route that they could potentially go in uh, for the Montreal Canadians. Um, right. I was, Cami uh, Granado is a name that I've always thought of for that. She's been a scout in the NHL yes. uh, for a long time. Interesting. Um, 
that's just one name that I thought of, and I only know her because I know her name because yeah, sister she's actually of she's the sister of Don Granado and Tony Granado, the Wisconsin head coach. But she also just recently got um, I don't know if I want to call it a promotion. She's she with, an expanded she's with role in hockey. She's with Seattle, but she just had an expanded role in the Hockey Hall of Fame. She's now got a Hockey Hall of Fame vote because somebody retired, and she's kind of rising up, um, and and they're and with the role within the Hall of Fame now too. I wouldn't um, be surprised if in the future that could be that could be something yeah. that we see in the future. Cami Granado potentially getting into management, upper level management. Right. She would be a, one of the women that I could see fast tracked in uh, in a role like that for sure. And fun fact: she's also the wife of uh, Ray Ferraro as well. Yes, so, yeah, that's like, a power. Just, that's a that, that's a hockey family through and through. Oh right yeah, there. oh yeah. Um, we will talk Olympics, Jack Hughes and Alex Ovechkin when we come back here on the Locked On NHL podcast. But first, the holidays are right around the corner and finding the perfect gift is tricky. Omaha Steaks makes it easy to send friends and family an unforgettable gift guaranteed to be loved. Go to omahasteaks.com and enter NHL into the search bar to order the perfect gift package for $99.99. You get 24 entrees like the world famous bacon wrap filet mignons. Chicken breasts, sides, desserts, and so much more. When you use the code NHL, you'll also get an additional eight Omaha Steaks burgers for free with your order. We've all heard the reports about shortages and shipping delays, so do not wait. Order the perfect gift package today at omahasteaks.com. You'll get eight free burgers when entering the code NHL. Achieve gifting greatness with Omaha Steaks. Incredible flavor, incredible value, and 100% guaranteed. omahasteaks.com, keyword NHL. All right, Mike. Mike Stefano, Jody Biasi here on the Locked On NHL podcast. We've got Cody CC entering COVID protocols in Edmonton. We've got all that's going on with the New York Islanders. The Senators had their shutdown uh, last weekend. Um, there are other people around the league that have entered COVID protocols that are escaping the top of my head right now. Gut feeling? Do, do we think the Olympics are, are to- kind of toast at this point for NHL players? Um. <sighs> I'm leaning towards no. I'm starting to lean towards no. And uh, I actually had Darren Dreger, uh, TSN Hockey Insider, on my show today. And he's also leaning towards no. He gave it a 60-40 split that they don't go. Um, This new variant really does add a bit of a wrinkle. And it seems like a lot of owners are really against this happening. And, And now that we see so many COVID cases popping up all over the league, um, and it just by by the day and, and just around the country, around North America, around the world, we're seeing COVID cases pile up. We talked about it right at the top of the show. Um, so I, I think that at the end of the day, it, it may it just might not happen. I know the NHL players really want to go. We as fans really want them to go, but it just not might not be safe. At the end of the day, might not be safe, might not be the year, unfortunately. Um, and, and if I had to to lay a wager, um, I would probably lay the lay uh, lay the under on games played by NHLers at the Olympics. Yeah, I'm actually uh, thinking that it's more and more likely it's over 50 percent as well that they don't go because for the first time we actually have a reason why the players don't want to go. And yeah. that was I forgot who was talking about that. It might have been Friedman, but I think actually this might have been uh, Frank Cervelli, uh of Daily Faceoff. Actually, it was, was Sarah Volley. It was, it was it about yeah. how NHL players are terrified of the idea of being in Beijing for the Olympics and having to they stick test around. positive for COVID and boom, right. You've got to stay in China by yourself without whatever ath- other athletes have. You've got to stay there for two weeks yeah. and like everyone else goes and you're just you're held up in China. And like this is happening around the sports world and really just in, in life in general, where like I've thought about that. Me and some buddies were planning a, a trip up to uh, Canada um, in January. And we're like, should we even do this? Because what happens if what happens if the U.S. decides, all right, no more travel across the border and we're there? Like what happens? Are we you think we are OK. But you don't know. Like, you don't even want to take that risk. You don't even want to think about that. And that's happening in golf, actually, this week. I don't know if you've seen this. There's a Canadian golfer that's been kind of stuck in South Africa. He went to play a tournament down there, and then suddenly the Canadian government and a lot of other governments put South Africa, because that is where this new variant originated, on the, the travel ban list. 
And now there's a Canadian golfer there, and there are a lot of other uh, English golfers that were playing in this tournament in South Africa, and they are they are stuck. Like, they are in Johannesburg, and they cannot leave. And I, if I'm an NHL player, and I'm seeing stories like that around the world and in sports, I might bail myself. So I don't even know if the owners and the NHL – Maybe, I mean, I would think at the end of the day, they'll still have to pull out to make it not happen. But yeah, I'm not sure the players will put up much of a fight as this continues. Well, I, I think there's going to be certain players that for the first time ever may decline it. Like even if the NHLers, like it, it may be a conversation where how many guys can we see decline the opportunity to go? I'm sure a lot of the Europeans will will go because they, put, they have so much pride in that. But I wonder about, you know, a guy like, a guy like Carey Price, if they say, hey, Carey, if he comes back in time, that is, you know, if they say, hey, we'd love to, to have you on the team. Like, I know you haven't played much this year, but you're you're our guy. You are, you know, the epitome of goaltending here in Canada. You know, we would like to bring you to the Olympics. I don't know if he'd be willing to do that. I don't know if he's in the right place in the, in the mindset where he'd be willing to, to leave here, leave his family, leave the situation he's in to go over to China to be in a bubble, essentially and have the risk of, of getting COVID and then having to stay there for a couple more weeks, you know, and I'm sure there's other players that are in a very similar boat um, that just aren't being vocal about this right now, but it sounds like according to Frank Cervalli that, you know, internally those discussions are starting to happen. So, you know, when you look at it, the, the, the owners or Gary Bettman at the very most definitely doesn't want them going. The mm -hmm. owners don't want them going. And now you have some players starting to grumble and moan about having to go there under these circumstances. It really does point to the NHL is not going to the Olympics. Yeah. That, by the way, that golfer story, I mentioned Adam uh, Cockerell, Cockerell is the name of the player and he's yeah. on his way back to Canada, but he had to, I have a to... funny, funny enough. I actually have a, a coworker currently who works at TSN. Mm -hmm. um, same thing. He's down in South Africa on like a wine tour. Yeah. And uh, clearly his vacation plans got uh, got interrupted and he has yeah. to make his way back here. But he, he's got to link up in a hotel room for, for 10 days or whatever. That's you got to go back brutal. into the hotel room type of type of thing when they come back over the border. Right. Cockerell had to go to Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt, Germany, and get tested, have that results come back. And then only then um he could go back to canada so it's a complicated road if you're ever stuck in a situation like that and right the players for the nhl might not want to go anywhere near it so we'll see i'm getting more and more pessimistic it sucks i do understand it though because this it's the world we live in it's the situation we live in that is like that's a, that's a tough place to have to go to right now go across the country with the government's not getting along also there's a dip the us i know is staging a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics. So like do you get help on that front. Like th there's just so many yeah. questions that you don't know the exact answer to. Uh, well, I think that one of the things that sucks most too, and as a, as a Canadian, and I'm sure as a hockey fan, you'll also hate it. The fact that this might be kind of the last hoorah for Sidney Crosby at the Olympics, hmm. you know, like four years from I'm, now. Be like oh, I know. I'm so upset. I'm like so 34, upset. 39 or 39 years old or so at the next Olympics, the odds of him a still playing B, you know, being in Olympic form are slim. And this could be the only time we could ever see Connor McDavid and Sidney Crosby together in a, on the international stage. And, and, you know, might have to miss out on that. Um, really, really sucks. Yeah. The, where are the next winter games? The next winter games after this 2026. year, 2026 winter Olympics. Um, let's see. Is it back Look in at, Italy? I thought I am. I think it's back in it Italy. Is. It's in Milan. Yeah. All right. We're, we're good. Europe, you know, the, the time zone difference isn't as bad. Um, they went there in 2006. Five hours. Still five hours, but all right. Um, let's move on to Jack Hughes. Eight years, sixty-four million dollars, eight million per year. What was your first thought when you saw that contract? Terrible. I'm assuming for the Devils. Yes. <laughs> um, look, I, I I get it. You're paying for, I guess, what you're hoping he gives you, not what he's done, because what he's done so far is not worth sixty-four million bucks. Um, I they have I quickly... sixty-four points. I quickly did some math. How many? He doesn't even have 64 points. That's right. So career. I did some I did some quick math. 
He legitimately, over the course of his career, he's got 55 points. He got paid $1.16 million <laughs> per point before getting a contract. NHL extension. record. I don't even have to look it up. Guarantee that is an NHL record upon signing. It's that's be. all he had to do. That That's it. Like, like it's just, it's, I mean, look, I understand Jack Hughes. They're hoping he's going to be the, the future. And his, his possession metrics, his analytics, obviously are very favorable. And the points didn't quite match up with the type of, um, or the production didn't quite match up with what the metrics say he should have done and what it, the type of production he should have. And I'm assuming as he progresses into into his career, you know, that should kind of round out into form. And I think he's going to be a really good player. But I think it's just a tad too early to to do that. You didn't you didn't have to do it now. You could have waited out the rest of this season, his third year in the NHL, and make sure that. You know, he's for real. Give him that third year, especially coming off of an injury. Give him that third year and make sure that you know that this guy can be your franchise number one center before paying him like that. Um, I just don't understand the timing of the deal either. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we're starting to see more and more of this in the NHL. The Coyotes were doing it for years and years. They did it with Jacob Chikrin. They did it with Clayton Keller. We saw the Rangers do it this past offseason where they did it with Igor Shesterkin, where teams are paying for the potential. And they're almost they're making a bet that, hey, we're going to take this financial risk because if it goes well and the player turns out to reach his, his ceiling and reach his potential – well, then suddenly, now we have an affordable contract. We have a bargain of a contract for years well, and years. What's Jack Hughes's, like, what's his ceiling? I, I That's what are the, the Devils, if you were going to ask the Devils that question in an honest moment, I bet you they would say, we think he can turn, we think he can turn into a $10 million player. Otherwise, you don't pay him $8 million for what he's done. Like, Jack you Eichel? have to believe he could turn into that. You think he's going to turn into Jack Eichel? I don't. I don't think he's going to be that. But the Devils that, that's what I mean. have to. The Devils have to. Well, let me see what the player comparables are for about eight million bucks. Let me let me just go and take a quick peek here. What uh, what some of these guys are making? Well, oh, while you do that, there really was. You mentioned the the advanced metrics. They're still not like an elite territory. They're not at eight million dollar territory. But year one to year two, there was a massive jump. I mean, the Corsi mm -hmm. four percentage went from forty five percent to fifty five percent. I mean, a 10 percentage point jump is massive. Um, expected goals for he went from 47 percent to 54 percent. So and you saw it like he he was a much he was much more confident and he was much better carrying the puck, the decision making, when to distribute. He was really driving play in year two, whereas year one, it just felt like he was a passenger. And every time I watched the Devils, he would just kind of fade into the play. Whereas last year he was really he was really driving it. So he did get better, but again, I still don't think anywhere near an eight million dollar player. Man, there are some bad players making eight million bucks. This isn't going to help my case, but <laughs> uh, Matt Duchesne currently on uh, on an eight million dollar ticket. Ryan He's having a year, season. right? He is having a good season. This season he is, but last year was god awful. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Johansson's on an eight million dollar ticket. Brent Burns, Logan Couture. Uh, Jacob Truba and John Carlson. So, you know, a bit of a mixed bag there. Thomas Shabbat as well is making eight million bucks. Uh, so a bit of a mixed bag, but I I still think that it's just it's just a little bit too early to pay a guy like that. Like I just don't think it was necessary to pay him now. If if he goes out and he has an exceptional back half of the season and he put you know churns out a point per game the rest of the way, okay, then maybe you could justify that. But a guy who only has like 50 points in, in about 100 games, like I just I don't see it. I don't know why you pay so much money for somebody like that. 20 goals for his career. And you're giving him $64 million. Um, <laughs> maybe the most comparable contract is the guy that went second overall the year before him in Andre Svechnikov, who mm. got a an extension for $7.75 million per season. And even he, though, had put up better numbers throughout his first two seasons than that, Jack, Jack Hughes did. Only marginally, but I guess that's the closest comparable that I could find for him some, for someone in his age range. Um, but yeah, I thought the Devils overpaid here in, in a situation where they didn't really feel like they needed to. The timing is even weird. He's not that, even on that, the ice. 
that's what I think he returned tonight. Actually, he like oh, they, okay. he returned to the ice and they announced it all, and it was just like a big thing. But um, I just the timing for me is is somewhat the biggest part of it. I mean, can he turn out to to be an eight million dollar player? Yeah, I think he can. I'm just I haven't seen it yet. Can my ch- mind be changed six months from now? Yeah, it totally can be. But as of now, as of today, it just it's a little early. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. If you were the Devils, well, I guess maybe you just wouldn't have signed him to an eight-year extension. I was going to ask, like, what number would you have signed him to an eight-year deal today? But maybe the answer is I just wouldn't have signed him to an eight-year deal today. Well, there's a number. I mean, if he wanted to come and sign at, like, five mil, <laughs> I probably would have signed him at eight right. times five. Well, forty $40 million deal, sure. But I'm sure that Jack wouldn't have signed that deal. Right, right. Um, but, like, yeah, I, I, what's interesting is it seemed like players were almost more willing to take bridge deals over the last couple of seasons, and this clearly yeah. is not not one of those bridge deals. That uh, do I don't know. Do we know by the way? Right, he goes to free agency after this, does he? Oh yeah, this is an eight year deal. Yeah, he'd be like eleven million. He'll be twenty eight years, years old. Eleven years into his career. Tw- yeah, he'll be twenty eight years old. Um. Yeah, so he'd be free agent. All right. Um, we want to talk Ovechkin. Let's first, though, remind you that this episode is brought to you by Bet Online, who has you covered for all season prop bets, odds, and lines um, more than ever before as football season continues to march to the playoffs for college football and for the NFL. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to their new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use your promo code LOCKED ON to receive your bonus. From basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers. Bet Online, the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. And speaking of of betting Joe DiBiase and Mike DiStefano here on the locked on NHL podcast, looking at Alex Ovechkin plus 800 to win the heart trophy. He is he's still third in the NHL in points first in the NHL in goals scored. The, the capitals are second. They're tied for first in the NHL in points. Um, I don't know. What do we think of this? Uh, we've got McDavid and dry well above him, but, Plus 800, like he's in the race. Uh, absolutely, he's in the race. I, I I, I, don't know if I'm ready to say that he is leading candidate. I'm just quickly looking to see if he scored it all tonight. Looks like he did not. Uh, that was a wild game, by the way. Florida, Washington. Washington was up 4-1, lost 5-4. Uh, anyways, um. I think he's totally in the race. I mean, I, I, I don't think, see why he couldn't. And he's got, what, 19 goals on pace for, like, almost 70 goals this season. Is he going to do that? Probably not. Uh, but the fact that he's doing this at such an old age, the fact that he's, you know, and I was also looking into the numbers a little bit today. And if you look at the five-on-five five numbers, points Ooh. per 60, he's he's leading dry Seidel by a full point going into yep. tonight's game. By a full point, he had 4.2 points per 60 to dry Seidel's 3.2. So dry Seidel's, you know, He's scoring a lot, of course, but it's really mostly due to that red hot power play. I don't want to say mostly, but it's very beneficial for the from that red hot power play with him and McDavid. But at five on five, that's where things are a lot more sustainable. And when you see Ovechkin clipping at the rate that he is, it seems to me like his goal scoring and his points are more sustainable than the rate that Dry Seidel is at right now. And um, you know, obviously McDavid's gonna be in, in the mix too. But I wonder if it comes down to it. Often there's a story behind these awards, right? Mm-hmm. Like there, a story is baked into it. You have Alex Ovechkin at age, what's he, 36 years old? 36. 36 yeah. years old, like playing 21, 22 minutes a night, going off, could potentially score 60 this season and be up there in the in the Art Ross race, the Rocket race. Um, I honestly do think that this is a, a legitimate case to be made that Ovechkin has a shot here in the MVP race. The other amazing five on five stat for him. He leads the NHL with 24 five on five points on the season. Aaron Ekblad is the only other player in the NHL who's even been on the ice for 24 five on five goals um, of his team's goals. So Ovechkin is just right. He, it's it's not like, like, how did we think his career might age? How do we think he might age? You know, 
He's just going to stand on the power play. He's not going to do too much. He's just going to rip one-timers until he's 43 years old, and that's how he's going to break Gretzky's record. Here he comes flying out of the gates. I watched a video of all of his goals scored on the season the other day, and like only a couple of them are just standing in the faceoff circle ripping clappers. Like He's yeah. got four power play goals for the season. 15 of them are five on five. He's deflecting goals. He's got three goals off deflections where he's like camped in front of the net. You can't move him. And he just, with a nice touch, puts it over the goalie. He's putting rebound attempts in because he's driving the net. He's in, he's in the high slot. Like he's going to those high danger areas. And he's also, by the way, being asked, this is why it's not even just about, you know, the goal scoring for him. He's got assists. Assists, right. He's already matched last year's total for assists with 18 in 22 games. He also is playing 21 minutes and 41 seconds of ice time per night. He hasn't played that much since 2010, like a decade. So the workload he's taking on, like, it's kind of incredible. Like, he has not really been this player for three, four years. He's just been the goal scorer. And he's back to being like that elite all-around offensive weapon. So this you make the the best point though about this. It's the MVP award. Subjective. You gotta have a story. And like it's the year of Ovechkin. Like he's chasing down records here. He's he's catching yeah. Brett Hall on the all times goal list. He's chasing down Dave Andrewchuk for the all time power play goal record. Like it's it, he's he's making history while he's doing this. And to me, that story is something that that MVP voters are just going to be eating up when it comes to the end of the season. But what's the biggest concern here? He's 36 years old and he's playing 22 minutes a night. Is he going to hold up? Like that's, I guess the biggest threat to this for him. Oh, absolutely. Like it's, it, it certainly is a, a big threat, but like Ovechkin has been nothing but a beacon of health and consistency his entire year yep. or his entire career. No, he, he really has been. I mean, the guy just doesn't miss games. He doesn't. And he comes out and he plays the same way. Um, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I really do. I, maybe it's just me hoping, but I, I really, I, here's a, here's an interesting little thing. We talked about this on my show today, considering what Ovechkin has done over the last couple of seasons. Do you think that it's possible when all said and done, if he, if he goes on, he has the year that he's projected to have, if he goes on and, and, and is able to do what he's been doing now and finishes the year, maybe wins an art Ross, wins a rocket Richard, uh, wins the MVP, you know, does all of that. Do you think that we could start re sparking up this mm -hmm. OV Crosby debate? I, I want to do it. I think it's, I think it's fair to do it. Um, I, I used. I don't I know. I, I almost want to say. You, I almost want to say you can already have it. You can already, used, already have the conversation. I, I used Tom Brady as as my example to to make this debate. Like ten years ago, you know, you could like Tom Brady, one of the best, right? He was one of the best. Just like ten years ago, Alex Ovechkin. Yeah, he's one of the best. Like no one scoring goals the way that he did. Like the guy was just unbelievable. Um, you know, th arguably one of the best goal scorers of of all time. And, but he just kept doing it and doing it. And now he just keep on, keeps on going as he gets older and older. And then eventually, you know, Brady just became the goat because he was able to do it into his forties. I'm not right. saying Ovechkin's going to do this and score 40 goals. So he's 45, but it's a bit of a different sports, bit of a different position. But the fact that he's doing this stuff at 35, 36 years old is super, super impressive, man. Um, so I, I almost feel like, and you look at Crosby's numbers, they've kind of come down a little bit over the last couple of seasons. Um, I, I just, I wonder if you can kind of have that debate. Cause when you look at it from start to finish, neither career is over. We were trying to say it was over. The conversation was over five years ago. A lot has happened in five years. Ovechkin has kept on pace. Crosby start to slip a little bit. Yeah. And, and I wonder if we can open that conversation back up again. By the way, correction from earlier, Ovechkin is second in the league in scoring. He has one more point than McDavid. Drysdale's first. Um, I think it will be hard. It'll be very hard for me to not put Ovechkin over Crosby if he gets the record. Like, it'll just be the Gretzky record. Yeah. It'll just be so definitive at that point. And to me, I already think, like, we could frame your Brady comparison in terms of just pure goal scoring. I think 
you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, even you might've said Ovechkin's one of the best goal scorers of all time, more and more, it's becoming very hard to say he's not the best goal scorer in hockey history. But yeah. like given the era he plays in, the consistency he's had over tw- over 15 years, and the fact that despite the era, despite the goaltending, he might just break the record anyway. I I, I don't think you're going to be able to make a case that he's not the best goal scorer of all time. And then suddenly it's, all right, yeah, Crosby better all around player, but Ovechkin is the best at one thing. He's the best at something in the history of the sport. And it's goal scoring. It's not something like niche. It's not, you know, like shorthanded goals. It's the point of the game. Score more goals than the other team. And if you do that better than anyone else in the sport of hockey, exactly, are are you considered like the best? And I think if he, if he just puts on this pedestal where he's just the undisputed best goal scorer of all time, Crosby is an all time great, probably top five, six, seven NHL player of all time. Yeah. What is he the best ever at though? His edge work has his is, edge work. Like again, <laughs> that's kind of niche, though. This that's kind of niche. Like, I know, he's maybe but like hockey's, third, hockey's but... such a subtle game where like that that really allowed him to be the best player and like outwork guys and and do stupid things that he was able to do in behind the goal where he's like flipping the puck and just embarrassing dudes and scoring easy you know wraparound goals that no one else could do. Um, and it's because of that edge work, because of that skating and, you know, his high hockey IQ. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting debate. Um, and, and I'm for it being reopened because five years ago, it was pretty well slam shut. You know, Crosby, when he won back to back cups, he now had three cups. Ovechkin had none. And then all of a sudden, Ovi won a cup. Yeah. And and it didn't change the conversation, but now when you look at what's going on, I think Crosby might have seven points through ten games this year, and then you look at what Ovechkin is doing, and it's like, huh? I mean, Ovechkin's yeah. also two years older too, which almost makes it more impressive. Um, do you feel like Ovechkin needs another cup though for that? <sighs> could do it this year, man. We just put him in the top four in our power rankings. I mean, that team right now—they're what? They're number one in the league right now, along with Toronto. Both have yeah. 33 points in 23 games. Ooh, is, that um, up, is that updated for Florida, though? Because yeah, yeah, they Well, Florida would be tied with them as well. They right. All three of them, sorry, have 33 points. Florida, one less game. So they're they're atop with, uh, by points percentage, I suppose. Carolina, technically sure. first in points percentage um, at 775. But, but your point is made. Like, they could win the Cup this year. Yeah. They could conceivably totally. win the Cup this year. Yeah. So... It's hey, the year of Ovechkin. This was about the MVP race, and I think I might want to make that bet. I might want to make that. The Oilers be... guys might take votes away from each other too. Yes, yes, yeah. that's another thing, right? Like they could totally end up taking votes. And when you look at it, it's like, well, who is the MVP? Can you have two most valuable players on the same team? I don't know. Maybe it is that it? one guy who's putting the team on his back and carrying them like Alex Ovechkin. Not that there's not a, a lot of talented players on the on the on the Capitals, but you know, yeah. you know that conversation is going to occur when it comes down to those three if those are the final three guys on the ballot that you're deciding between. Right. All right. Anything else uh, you want to get in here? You think we pretty much covered everything. I think we Yeah, I think just uh DeBrusque, I don't know if you want to talk DeBrusque, but DeBrusque eh. requested a trade. Probably don't even talk about that, but it's notable, so we can just say that, and I did, so we're good worth, there. Worth mentioning, right? Jake DeBrusque might be on the move. Um, yeah. I want to slip in here something uh, good for the NHL for suspending Brad Marchand. Uh, um, I just wanted to throw that along. because Brendan Lemieux. Brendan Lemieux got five games, too, for biting for Ma- uh, trying Brady Trying to Kachuk. eat Brady Kachuk's hand yeah. uh, twice. Yeah. Um, yeah. A little kibble. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a couple of suspensions that, you know, I think the NHL could have maybe just not done anything and maybe they would have gotten away with it. And they said, no, we're going to suspend them five games too. like that's, that's a, that's a real suspension. Um, and then uh, one other thing that's not Eastern conference related, we try to stick on the Eastern conference. Uh, just kind of funny that Evander Kane is in the AHL right now. Well, I mean, like, that's going to be so weird. Murray. And, and, Matt Matt, Murray. and Matt Murray. Kane is obviously there for a completely different reason. Murray has just been like, he can't play hockey. Uh, Kane is there because literally his Sharks teammates like don't want him in the locker room. Um, he, 
what is he going to do in the AHL though? Like, have you ever thought about that at all? Like the guy was almost a point of game player in the NHL last year. I, I'm kind of just curious to see know. what the numbers will look like for him in the, in the AHL, but I don't know um, how long he's going to be there. Like I, his agent, Dan Milstein, apparently working the phones, trying to get a deal done. I would assume oh, San Jose. Take that? Who's going to take that right now? Well, I, I would assume San Jose is willing to eat half that salary. That's, that's actually, I think there was, that was reported that they would do that. Like, so. I mean, as opposed to eating all 5 million of it, they only have to eat half of it. Um, 5 million because what is it? 1.2. You can bury the miners and then the rest of the cap uh, goes against the cap, the rest of the contract. So they can bury a major. Um, uh, so instead of having 5 million against the books, you can only have three and a half against the books. If you trade them at half his pop, but you know, how many teams want to bring in that, you know, problem. Like there's just problem after problem with that guy. Yeah. It's, it's becoming almost indefensible at this point to have him on the roster on your roster. That's it's a also tough... hilarious. It's hilarious that Vancouver is one of the teams that consistently gets talked about and they're just, yeah. it's a, well, they're... a tire fire as is the locker room doesn't seem to be very cohesive and you want to bring Evander Kane in. What the that's, hell? That's desperation. Is if is what that <laughs> is. If you do that, you know what's going to happen. Actually, I know, I know what's going to happen. I, I got it. I figured it out. He's going to get traded to Arizona. The Coyotes are going to get a pick to take him, and then they're going to buy him out at the end of the year. Right? Yeah, that could happen. That the could Coyotes happen. do that with everybody. This is kind of a little different because it's midseason, but yeah, I mean, they'll... they could they could also play him. They could, right? They could also just <laughs> like do that. they could just play the guy. Like realistically, I mean. What's a buyout? They need bodies. Like they need bodies. That 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 might be it. You know, you attach a pick or a prospect to them, and and away you go. Buy Vander. Three point six million and a buyout next year. Then two point six. Then four point six. And then it's one point six for the next three years. What what do you what do you get to to take that on? Like mm. a first. The Sharks aren't giving you their first though to take that. So. No, they're not going to eat half the salary and give you the first they might be a second eat half and give you a second or yeah. if you take the full thing then they might give you a first for that but uh, in this economy i don't uh, i don't see any team taking on a full seven million dollars of evander kane for yeah. four more years right all right uh we'll leave it there then uh follow us on twitter i'm at sneaky joe sports mike is on twitter at mickey underscore canuck if you are not watching us currently um be sure to check out our youtube channel locked on nhl where you can watch the podcast uh and you can see beauties like my fall is elite sweatshirt that i'm currently wearing right now um even though it's like you know 20 degrees and like wet snow outside right i now, wish it was so. 20 degrees joe I wish. <laughs> no you're right actually it's worse because it's like 36 36 is like the worst degree sorry fahrenheit what would that be for celsius uh i gotta six, remember the 36 would be listeners. like two degrees two degrees it's like two yeah. degrees out right now horrible it's like the worst um anyways that's it for us we'll get out of here uh follow us on twitter again at sneaky joe sports and at mickey underscore canuck and this has been the locked on nhl podcast thanks for making us your first listen every day now go make your second listen locked on bets your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs locked on bets hosted by your boy q with expert analysis and insight from lee sterling it's free and available on all platforms